Hello and welcome to the demonstration video for superconductivity. We'll be showing two of the effects that superconductors have on magnetic fields, the Meissner effect on an inductor and magnetic levitation. Okay, so let's get started on the first part of the experiment in which we're setting up an LRC circuit and measuring its resonant frequency so as to determine the value of the inductance. We have here a capacitor and a resistor and I believe the values for those are given to you in the lab write-up, but it's always smart to check to make sure you've gotten the right things because sometimes people grab a resistor out of a drawer and somebody else has put the wrong thing back in that drawer. So let's check the resistor first. So I'm going to set my multimeter to the ohms range. This particular multimeter is a little bit funky. So you can see even though I set it for ohms, it first started off reading AC volts. Now I can see it's reading correctly on the mega ohms range. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and connect this um, banana to coax adapter. Um, so while I've got this here, let me show you. There's a little tab on this side, and if I don't know if you can see it there, but it says GND. So that means that this this banana clip, this banana plug, is connected to the outer conductor of the coax, and this one is connected to the inner conductor. So let's use this male-to-male -male adapter, and then coax to alligator clip adapter, and we'll plug that in there with, doesn't really matter for this measurement, but I'm going to plug it in with the GND side connected to the COM terminal on my multimeter. And then let's connect the resistor, like so. Oh, let me point out one thing. Every time you use a multimeter, without exception, you should always start by putting it on the ohms range and just touching your two probes together to make sure that you have good contact. So you ought to get some very low resistance reading. That's because sometimes, especially when you're using probes like this, the pointy kind, when you plug them in, they might seem to make good connection, but not actually. So just every single time, even if you just used it 10 minutes ago, go ahead and check it again um, to make sure it's still, you still have good contact. It doesn't take long and it saves you a lot of trouble. So let's connect this resistor up. And you can see the reading there. 196.2 ohms. Now I'm going to connect the capacitor. So I have to switch this from the ohms mode to the capacitance mode. And again, this one's a little bit funky, so let me see if I can get it to actually go into ohms mode. There we go. And you can see it's got an offset of 0 0.009 nanofarads. That's from the capacitance in the leads. So we need to subtract that from whatever capacitance we measure. So I'll hook this up. So that's reading 94.9, nanofarads minus 0.009 or so, but we can't even see that digit here. It's interesting, it's drifting slightly down. I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. Maybe something a little bit off with this meter. So that looks pretty stable now, 93.5 nanofarads. Okay. Then we also have a standard inductor um, just to kind of test things out. So we'll use this first, and then we'll use the, um, the same circuit. We'll replace this inductor with our susceptometer, the thing we're going to use in the actual experiment. So this is an inductor that says 10,000 mu h, so 10,000 microhenries, or 10 millihenries. And we're going to assume that that's correctly uh, marked because a typical multimeter like this can't measure uh, inductance. All right, so I'm going to set up the circuit. As I'm doing it, I'm going to intentionally make some mistakes. 
and I'm going to pause the video after I've made each mistake and I want you to think about it and to actually write down on your report form what, uh, what was the mistake that I made. So pause the video, write it down. If you can't figure it out, it's okay, you can unpause it, but I want you to think for at least a couple of minutes uh, about what's, what's the mistake that I made before you unpause. But if you need to unpause, and then we'll talk about it, and then you can fill in your form after you've seen me discuss it, that's, that's completely fine. So first, let's power things up. For now, all we need is the oscilloscope and our function generator. This is kind of a fancy function generator because it needs to be able to create the swept frequency. Okay, so we want to set up our function generator to perform the sweep frequency that we're going to use to detect the resonance frequency. So first I'm going to um, check the um, amplitude. So that's right here. I could uh, press this button to highlight it. It's already set to 5 volts, so that's good. That's a nice healthy amplitude. If it were set to something lower, I would increase it. So now I need to move to a different menu to set up the sweep. So I push this button, the sweep button. And now you can see over here it's set to a linear sweep, meaning it's going to start at the start frequency and the frequency will change linearly in time until it gets to the stop frequency. Um, the sweep time currently is set to one second. I'm going to change that to five seconds. So I push five <coughs> and then the unit of seconds. The return time is set to zero milliseconds, meaning it's going to sweep slowly from the start to the stop and then suddenly jump back to the start and start over. That's what I want. I could change this to, let's say, five seconds as well if I wanted it to slowly sweep up and then slowly sweep down, but that's not what I want. Um, so then I want to change the start frequency. I'm going to try 250 hertz. And the stop frequency we can be pretty generous, so maybe let's try 25 kilohertz here. Uh, I think I pushed the wrong button. 25 kilohertz. All right, so that's all set to go. So um, now I can push this button here to actually start it outputting that on channel one. If that's not lit up, it's not actually outputting it. And now I will connect that using this coax. Zoom out so you can see what I'm doing. So let's connect channel one from the signal generator to channel two on the oscilloscope. So here is question A for you. Why am I not seeing anything on the oscilloscope? I just see a flat line, but I know that this is putting out a 5 volt peak to peak uh, swept frequency. So I should be seeing something healthy. Let me zoom in on the oscilloscope. Because I will give you the hint that the problem is with the way that I've got the oscilloscope set up. So now you can see the, all the settings on the oscilloscope pretty well. What am I doing wrong? So pause the video, think about it on your own, and then come back. This is question A. So the problem is that the scope is right now only showing channel 2. And I've got this connected to channel 1. So I'm going to turn off channel 2 by pressing this button a couple of times and turn on channel 1 and there's my signal. You can see that it's sort of over a five second period starting at a pretty long period and then the period is getting shorter. Let's check whether it's maintaining a constant amplitude as it does that sweep. So I'll use the cursor, so I push the cursor button. It's already set for manual and type Y, which is what I want. So now I can set one cursor up at the peaks, about there. And then I'll set the other cursor down at the bottom. And we can see it does look pretty good. Looks like the amplitude is staying quite constant as it changes the frequency, which is what's supposed to happen. All right, so now I want to connect that into my circuit card, my circuit board here. So let me get a coax T to make that connection. I'll attach the coax T here. And then I'll attach the other side through the short coax to a coax to banana adapter. 
I'm going to take the side that has the GND tab on it and I'll plug that into the black banana connector there. Now I want to build a series LRC circuit. So I'm going to zoom in on the circuit board because I'm about to make a mistake on the circuit board and I want you to see if you can figure out what I'm doing wrong. Okay, so again here is the, the cable that's coming from the signal generator which has our swept frequency coming in. So I'm going to start with our resistor and I will plug it in here so as to connect it to this banana cable and then I'll plug it into one of the rows of holes there and next I will zoom in a little bit further so you can see even better what I'm doing. I'm not making mistakes about which hole I plug things into but that would be hard for you to see. Then I'm going to take my capacitor, I'll plug that into the same row as the resistor and into a different row here and then I'm going to take my inductor, plug it into that same row and then plug it in here so as to connect it to this side. So I've just made a mistake. Look at what I've done, think about it, pause the video, then come back. Okay, so the problem is that these two banana connectors are not connected to this breadboard in any way. You have to make that connection yourself. So let's go ahead and do that. Again, I'm back to possibly making mistakes. So watch out, see if you can catch when I make the next mistake. So I'm going to take, I'm going to screw this up and you can see that there is a, try to get a good angle for you to see this. There is, it's hard for you to see it. There, that's a good angle. There's a hole in the base of this. So I'm going to plug my wire, I'm going to put my wire into that hole and screw down so that I get a good connection. I'm kind of doing it on the back side. You would not have to do it that way, um, but I'm going to do it that way just for clarity. And then I'm going to plug that here so as to connect from that hole to this set of five holes here. And then I'll do a similar thing here. I'm going to slide this into the hole here. You can't see what I'm doing very well there, but I guarantee that that's not the mistake that I'm making. I'm making a good connection to that wire there. And then I'll plug that into this set of five holes here so that it's now connected to the resistor. So I've got this red wire connected to this group of five and the black wire connected to this group of five. But I've made another mistake. So what mistake have I made now? Okay, so pause the video, think about it, this is question B, and when you think you have an answer or you, get, you feel like you're stumped, come on back. So the problem is that this row of holes, these are all in, let me zoom back out a little bit, this row from here all the way down to this, there's what are they? Five groups of five. They're all internally connected inside of here. This outer row is all connected and then separately from that this outer row is all connected. The groups of five are the ones that are this way. So this group of five is connected and then separately from that this group and then separately from that this group. This row up here is separate from this row over here. So if you, sometimes you'll see that people add a little jumper wire to connect that so that it's connected all the way down. So I can't connect it this way at all. So I'm going to go ahead to fix that. So again, I might be making mistakes, so pay attention. To fix that, I'm going to move the connection on the resistor from here to, sorry, let's make a little space here, to this row here. Um, by the way, it's kind of interesting to see what's happening on the oscilloscope. When I, so I just, I haven't yet moved the red wire. So right now the red wire and the black wire are actually connected together through, through the breadboard. If we look at what's happening on the scope right now, there's nothing there. 
That's because we have shorted the output of the signal generator to the ground through this. So if I pull this out, now we suddenly we get our signal back. So I'm going to take that red wire and instead of putting it into that long row of holes, I'll put it into the same row that the resistor is in. And now you can see if we look at the oscilloscope that we have not, we've fixed that problem of shorting the, um, shorting the signal generator out. Just lower this so we can kind of see both the oscilloscope and the circuit at the same time to the extent possible. It's pretty good there. All right, so next I need to monitor the output of this. Again, pay attention, I'm about to make a mistake. To monitor it, I'm going to use this, which is the 10X probe. You hopefully have seen that before. So I'm going to plug that into channel 2. I'm going to bring up the menu for channel 2 here, and I check to make sure it's set to 10X. Um, that's quite important. Every time you connect something, make sure you've got the correct probe selected because the oscilloscope automatically compensates for the way the probe works. Uh, 10X probe um, actually cuts the amplitude of your signal by a factor of 10, um, but improves the input impedance of your scope by a factor of 10, so that's why it's called 10X. So most of the time, that's a good trade-off, but you want the oscilloscope to know that you've cut your signal amplitude by a factor of 10, so it compensates for that. So that's what pressing this 10x probe does. Let's just make sure that channel 1 is set for 1x, so that's, that's good. All right, so now back to possibly making mistakes. I'm going to zoom in on the circuit so you can see where I'm connecting. So I want to monitor the current flowing through the circuit, which will be maximized when I'm at resonance. So I'm going to monitor the voltage across the resistor because that voltage is proportional to the current. So I'm going to hook the hooky part of my 10x probe to one side of that resistor and this other part I'm going to hook to the other side of my resistor like so. All right, I've just made a mistake. So think about this, this one's a little bit more subtle than the ones that I made before, but it's a very common mistake that people make. So I've just made an error in the way that I've connected my oscilloscope. This is question C. Think about it on your own. What error did I just make? Pause the video if you need to, and then unpause when you get feel like you're stumped or you think you have the right answer. So the problem is that this is a ground connection. And so when I connect it like this, the current is coming in from here, going through the resistor. It just goes to ground through this. It doesn't go through the rest of my circuit. So I don't actually have an LRC circuit. I just have a resistor. So what's the way to fix that? I'm not going to pose this as question D because that We'll get to question D later, but just what's the quick way? There's a one really quick way I could fix it. And part of the issue is that the oscilloscope, this probe, is always measuring voltages relative to ground. That's the way an oscilloscope is built. There's nothing you can do about that. So I can start to solve the problem by removing this, but now, of course, I'm just measuring the voltage across the entire circuit relative to ground. So there's a better thing that I could do. I'm going to just flip this around so that now this side of the resistor is already connected to ground anyway. Right? Here's the ground tab. So this red wire, I've, I've screwed up my color coding, but it's not that serious. This red wire is connected here. So when I connect this ground clip to there, it doesn't actually screw up the action of the circuit. And so now I can actually monitor just the voltage across the resistor like this. So I have my probe here and my ground connection there. The current is actually coming in through here, through the inductor, the capacitor, and the resistor. 
Let's see how that looks on the scope. So you can see as the frequency sweeps, pay attention to the blue curve, which is channel 2, that's the output. It sort of starts at a pretty low value, and then it goes up, and then starts coming back down. So we can see qualitatively the resonance curve there. I'm going to turn off channel 1 to emphasize this a little bit more. So there it starts, it grows, and then it starts to shrink again. To measure quantitatively where that peak frequency is, I'm going to change the number of divisions per second here. So that's over here. Right now we're set to 100 microseconds per division. So let's go to 5... Um, yeah, 500 milliseconds per division. That's pretty good. So that's going to be, in principle, that's five seconds all the way across the screen. And because um, it's 500 milliseconds times 10 divisions across the screen. Uh, and that's in practice, too. And so there's the beginning of our sweep. You can see it goes up, reaches a peak, and then slowly comes back down. Um, I actually, it would be better if I was sweeping a little bit quicker so that my whole sweep would fit on one screen full. I'm not going to bother to show you this, but I'm going to go over to the signal generator and change the sweep time from 5 seconds to 4 seconds. Uh, sweep time 4 seconds. There. So now the whole sweep, if we get lucky and catch it correctly, the whole sweep will fit on one screen full. Um, and you can also see that I'm kind of I've got, got my low frequency position well below my peak. My high frequency, which is here, is maybe higher than I need it to be. So remember that I had been sweeping from 25 hertz to 25 kilohertz. I'm uh, sorry, from, I meant to be sweeping from 250 to 25 kilohertz, but actually it's set from 25, to 25 hertz to 250 to 25 kilohertz. The 25 I kind of like, so I'm going to leave that, but let's change the top one. And I'm not going to show you, I'll just narrate that I'm going to change the, um, the stop frequency from 25 kilohertz, let's say 10 kilohertz. Looks like that would be good. And so now let's see how that looks. So now that's a little bit, the resonance frequency is a little bit more centered. So that looks pretty good. So I'm just going to wait until we get one sweep that's contained entirely good and then I'm gonna hit the stop button here to just freeze the display because this is a good display I can see the beginning of the sweep here and the end so from here to here that's exactly four seconds where it should be let's check that so I'll use the cursors press the cursor button change the type to X and the source to channel 2. And so now let's just verify that the whole sweep should be 4 seconds. So set cursor A on the left of it. Cursor B on the right of it. And the delta, delta X is 4 seconds. So that's correct. So now we want to measure the resonance frequency. So I'm going to move the second, I'll leave the first cursor at the beginning, I'll move the second cursor to the peak. So that's about there. We're just practicing right now because this is still with our 10 millihenry inductor. And so now the delta X is 2.02 seconds. So use that to calculate the value of the inductor and compare that with the expected value of 10 millihenries and fill that in on your report form. You can pause the video for a few moments while you do that, because I really want you to do that right now. Make sure you're understanding it before you continue. Okay, so now we are just going to replace that fixed 10 millihenry resistor with a 10 millihenry inductor with the actual inductor that contains our superinductor. So I've got to fish it out of this jar. This jar is filled with desiccant to keep our superinductor from going bad. So, oops. so I'll recap this right away to keep the desiccant good. And let's take a quick look at 
what we've got here. So inside here, there's the coil, which is wrapped around and around our sample of superconductor. And there's also the thermocouple junction in there. The other end of that thermocouple is attached here. These are the two ends that are attached to the coil, to the inductor. So I'm going to simply remove, I'm not making mistakes here, We're done with that part. I'm going to remove the 10 millihenry inductor and instead plug this inductor in place of it. It doesn't matter which side goes to where, inductors are um, symmetrical in that way. And so now we are ready to measure its inductance. I've got the sweep set up the same way, so let's see how it works. I'll press the run button. It's accumulating the data. And so you can see now, I didn't quite reach the maximum. So I need to change my sweep interval. So I'll go back to my function generator and maybe let's start at five kilohertz and end at, uh, oh sorry, that was start at five kilohertz and end at, let's say, 40 kilohertz. Five to 40. Now let's see how we're doing on the oscilloscope. So that's, that's adequate. The 40 is maybe a little bit of an overkill, right? Because you can see we reached the peak here. So maybe we're going from 5 to 40, so it's roughly at 10. So I'm, I won't uh, bother to show you this, but I'm going to change that 40 to 20. Okay, so now we have it set up. We're starting our sweep at 25 hertz, ending at 25 kilohertz, and you can see the maximum in between. Let me wait to get a good one that looks pretty good so I'll hit the stop button and we'll set one cursor at the peak and the other one at the beginning that's pretty accurately at the beginning the, I've got cursor B that's about where I would guess the peak is so the delta X is 1.64 but now let's determine the uncertainty in that the peak might be, it's a pretty broad peak, so it might be like about there. Could be there. So that's 1.80. But if I go even a little further, I'm almost, I'm positive it's not there. So that 1.80, that would be a 95% confidence interval. And then if I go on the other end, I would say my 95% confidence interval is maybe about there. So that's at about 1.50 seconds. So from that, you should pause the video now and calculate the inductance of the inductor inside of this. For the actual experiment, this is a very inconvenient way of measuring inductance using this circuit and trying to find the peak value. So in a serious research context, that's not the way somebody would measure inductance. Instead, they would use something like this which is a dedicated, it's called an LCR meter. Let me zoom in on it. And so that means that it can measure inductance, L, capacitance or resistance, and it can do it rather precisely. So let's power that up. And this is what we're going to actually use to measure the inductance, the capacitance, and the resistance. Um, so right now, there's nothing connected, so you should ignore what it's reading. You will see that it, it has, let me zoom out, it's got, it's connected to these four connectors that are, two of them are connected to this alligator clip, and two of them are connected to this alligator clip, and then the outer conductors of, so that's, those are the inner conductors, let's say the inner conductors of l Kerr and l Pot. those are connected to either side of the black one, the inner conductors of H pot and H cur are connected to the red one. This is called a four probe measurement. And its purpose is to avoid problems that are associated with making a connection to things. So for example, if I was using this to measure the value of our resistor, 
when I connect a resistor up to a regular ohm meter, at the connections there's extra resistance. And so that resistance is measured in series with the resistance of your resistor and it throws off your reading. Using this four probe method we can avoid that extra resistance. Um, so I want you to go to Wikipedia and look up four probe resistance measurements and understand them on your own. I'm not going to ask you to write up anything about it, but if you're giving an oral report uh, about this, you should be ready to answer a question about how that works. The, um, these four things might be labeled, the L cur might be labeled I minus on Wikipedia and H cur I plus, meaning that the current is coming out here going through your resistor and back into the low part. The voltage is being measured here and here, so POT stands for potential. So in the Wikipedia, this might be labeled instead of H POT V plus and instead of L POT V minus. So those two are connected to one side of each of these and that's measuring the voltage difference. So basically the current is flowing in, I don't know which side it is, but let's say the current is flowing in on the back side of each of these clips and the voltage is being measured from the front side. So see if you can understand how that allows you to avoid measuring, adding the, the value of the contact resistance between the clip and the wire when you're trying to measure the resistance of this resistor. So this resistance that it's measuring here, 196.1, that's much more accurate than the resistance that we'd measure using our regular uh, multimeter. All right, so we want to measure inductance, which it's already set up to do. So I'm going to connect the two clip leads to the two sides of our inductor, like so. So that's set up there now, maybe you can see. And it's reading an inductance of 2.506 millihenries. It's also telling you the resistance of that coil. And you might think about why does it need to make both measurements? Um, and in order to answer that question, you have to understand that this is using a fixed frequency. You can tell it what frequency to use, but following the suggestions of the manual, we're using a fixed frequency of 800 hertz. So think about why do I need to measure both the resistance? Why do I have to know the resistance in order to accurately calculate the inductance? But um, Mostly what we care about is that this gives us an accurate value of the inductance. And so in the Excel file that we provide for you, we're going to give you that inductance as one of the columns. The other column is going to be the reading on this multimeter. So let's go ahead and turn that on. And that we're going to connect to this final connector. So there's sort of three wires coming out of our sample assembly. Two of them go to either side of the, of the inductor. This is, it's actually two wires here, it's a cable. So this is the thermocouple and you can maybe see that there are two different colors here. I could hook it up to something like this. This is called a thermocouple controller and this is the way you normally would do it. So if I turn it on there, and plug it into the top, like so. I have to make sure that the correct type of thermocouple is selected. So this is indeed a type T, and so it's reading room temperature reasonably accurately. It's pretty warm in here, so I believe that. That's not the way we're actually gonna do it. Um, we're gonna measure it in a way that's um, what is described in the lab manual. So instead, we're gonna measure the voltage across it by hooking the output of this up to the multimeter. So we'll use a pair of clip leads. I'm going to connect the red one. I think that goes to the copper colored one and the black one to the other one. And then we'll get a coaxial cable, connect that there and connect the other end of that to our multimeter here. 
So you can see right now, you zoom in on the multimeter, we're at room temperature and it's reading minus 0 0.018 roughly millivolts DC. So that's the second column in the Excel spreadsheet that we give you is this um, reading here. And in order to interpret that reading, you have to know the temperature of this junction. Because the calibration table that we give you that converts from millivolts to degrees assumes that this junction is at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And if it's higher than that, then you have to add that temperature difference to it. So we measure that with a thermometer that we held quite closely. And those thermometer readings are given to you in that same spreadsheet. OK, um, I think that's it for the first part of the lab. Paul is now going to tell you about the second part. But first, we're going to bury the inductor in some sand. Cooling the sand instead of the inductor gives the system some extra thermal inertia so it won't heat up or cool down too quickly for us to observe it. Now it's time to get things cold. We'll be using liquid nitrogen to cool the sand and the inductance probe down to below their critical temperature. Now it's time for magnetic levitation. We'll be using a different high temperature superconductor. This one is yttrium barium copper oxide, or YBCO. This little cube is a magnet, which is why I'm using plastic tweezers instead of metal ones. Now I'll add some liquid nitrogen and you can see what happens. For the next bit, I'm going to slow down some of the effects so that you can see the motion of the magnet in detail. Here, I'm trying to displace the magnet laterally. I'm trying to rotate it around some of its other axes. Very stubborn magnet. Now I'm trying to change its preferred height above the superconductor.
And finally, uh, you can watch as the liquid nitrogen runs out. Hopefully this video has given you some impression what it would have been like to carry out these observations in the lab.